24-hour cameras, wildlife sitcom and drama, emotional cliffhangers, reality TV at its best. The difference? The actors, African wildlife. The set, the African bush. The scriptwriter and producer, Mother Nature. Last time on Wildlife Diary, Maggie introduced her cubs to the pride. Duchess organized a peace deal between Alf and Biggles. Melissa showed that she could be a mother along with the best of them. And Rolani struggled to eat his giraffe amidst a lot of interference. Researchers report that Rolani may have other problems looming on the horizon. The leopard detects a strange foreign scent round and about his territory. At first he appears unconcerned, but then, as night falls, the sounds of the bush confirm his suspicions. Rolani shrugs off the calls of the male intruder. He'll deal with this in his own time. But who is this interloper? Could he prove more powerful than Rilani? The rest of the Karangwe herd is tired of Flippy's antics. Feeling ignored, the young bull chooses to spend some time on his own. The Karangwe winter has not been kind to Cobra and Shungu. The brothers are failing to bring down any meat, to make ends meet. This time, a tragic discovery. The wild dogs do what they do best. Lisa stands guard over Maggie's wildebeest kill. And the hyenas continue their nocturnal explorations. The Adini section in recent weeks has been the happy frolicking ground of Melissa's brood. The proud mother has done well to get the five youngsters this far, considering the high mortality rate of cheetah cubs. Her astute parenting skills have raised everyone's hopes. Perhaps these beautiful cubs may just survive to maturity. But it's only a matter of days and Adini once more reveals the results of nature's harsh methods. Yeah, uh -huh. Is this where you found it? Yeah, everything is exactly as we found it. Nothing's been moved. I have no doubt that you can see the lions. The whole spine's broken. One bite to the to the back, and it looks like one bite to the head. And just left like this. Head researcher Kaylee Owen and Karangwe manager Philip Owen are devastated. But nothing in comparison to Melissa, who desperately calls for her cubs. The remaining cubs have trauma and shock written all over their little faces. With some relief, Melissa realizes that a few of her litter are still alive. But how many? Melissa hopes to coax them from their hiding place by stretching out and inviting them to suckle. The plucky timber emerges. That makes three so far. The young female snuggles into her mother for comfort. The relieved cheetah grooms Timber with tenderness.
These terrifying events put all thoughts of food on the back burner. Now the ravenous Temba makes up for lost time and seeks out a nipple. The third cub arrives to seek comfort, raising the prospect that the fourth one may have also survived. The researchers observe the reunion, trying to compute exactly what must have happened. The dead cub undoubtedly met its end at the hands of a lion while Melissa was out hunting. But where is number four? Temba hears a bird call, which she misinterprets as a cry from the missing sibling. One of the cubs chirrups in response, leading Melissa to show some interest in the possibility of another cub being alive. The mother remains on high alert. The lions might still be in the area. Understandably, she's anxious, tense and aggressive. The cub's face says it all. The fourth one is nowhere to be found. Melissa settles down again to wait. The researchers speculate that a jackal may have taken the missing sibling. He might have been following the lions and then snatched one of the cubs in the confusion. And then there were three. With a heavy step, Melissa gives up and encourages the remaining cubs to follow her. This situation she has encountered many times before. Returning from the hunt to the scene of a family massacre. Can she stay focused and ensure that Temba and her two brothers make it through the next few perilous months while the odds are stacked against them? Coming up, the wild dogs get down to business. And Lisa chases off an unwelcome scavenger. The Mandulia section recently hosted peace talks between Alf and Biggles. Duchess got the boys together out of concern that all the infighting was affecting the flow of food to her and the pups. Today, it's as though none of the unpleasantness ever happened. Alf and Biggles keep each other warm on an icy winter's morning, like an old married couple. Time to prime those lazy muscles for action. There's a den full of pups and a hungry mother waiting for food. Alf is determined to lie in. Biggles waits patiently, with his injured ear much in evidence. Duty calls, and Alf finally manages to brave the cold. No trace remains of the recent animosity between the two boys. The fight that re-established the pecking order left Biggles firmly in the driving seat. Duchess initiated the conflict, but then got the boys to bury the hatchet when she saw that no hunting was getting done. The two males warm up for a busy day. Alf acknowledges Biggles' dominant status by grooming his sore ear. In bygone days, it was Alf who got the royal treatment from Biggles. Duchess takes matters into her own hands. 
She caused the fight. She got them to make up. And now she leads the first hunting expedition since the conflict settled. If anyone's in control here, it's Duchess. The Karongwe winter is never kind to predators. As the vegetation dries and retreats, prey animals enjoy increasing visibility and spot the hunters coming long before it's too late. But a pack of wild dogs is a formidable weapon. They hunt cleverly, cooperating at every turn and bring down their victims with ferocity. Duchess unerringly leads the boys to a location she knows is richly supplied with impala. This female has come a long way since her days in a captive breeding program. Duchess and Biggles shred the impala while the subordinate elf enjoys a scrap nearby. After bolting down chunks of meat, the Duchess will return to the den and regurgitate some of it for her pups. They've been on solid since they were two weeks old, although they'll continue suckling until three months of age. Can Duchess keep the boys focused on hunting? Will the pack bring home enough meat to feed, we still don't know how many, hungry mouths? Last time in Chippenberry. Maggie single-handedly brought down a wildebeest. The rest of the pride got wind of the kill and joined her and her cubs at the feast. This was the first time Lisa and her two sub-adult offspring had met the youngsters. Not surprisingly, Maggie felt a bit anxious and uncomfortable about this and left the scene. It's the morning after the feast. The wildebeest carcass lies apparently unattended. Unattended by the pride, that is. A black-backed jackal is very much paying attention to the leftovers. The jackal assesses his odds very carefully. The coast definitely seems to be clear. The jackal immediately picks up on the lazy flick of a lion tail and starts to guzzle his scrap at a stomach-churning rate. Again, the flick of the tail catches his eye, and he decides that this snack would be better savoured away from the danger zone, and not a moment too soon. Lisa returns to breakfast on the carcass. Unwisely, the jackal comes back for more. He figures that if he operates on the periphery of the kill, he should be safe. He figures wrong. Lisa shows zero tolerance for this cheeky scavenger. The winter has put the squeeze on everyone's resources. And the jackal is hungry enough to take risks. Limu returns to the carcass and does what he should have done last night. Rake some earth over the strong-smelling wildebeest stomach contents. Leaving bad odors around the dinner table only serves to attract pesky intruders like the jackal. Ideally, the carcass should be further concealed behind the tree, but it proves much too difficult for the inexperienced sub-adult Luma to move on his own. The 
the jackal returns, driven by starvation, to stake his own life on a piece of offal. The scavenger makes a judgment call based on experience. That lion is too far away to pose a threat. Luma watches the jackal. His youth renders him unsure of what to do in a situation like this. And the jackal gets away with it. But all good things must come to an end. Having eaten a good meal, the scavenger feels he shouldn't tempt fate any longer. As night falls over the Kurongwe, the feast continues. Lisa's sub-adults aim to get a lot more mileage out of this wildebeest. But fate intervenes. The males arrive to claim their share. As Felix's shadow darkens the carcass, Limu and Luma scatter in the interests of survival. In the hierarchical scheme of things, Felix and Zero will go to any lengths to preserve their first place at a kill. Maggie's nervousness at last night's sitting stemmed precisely from her fear that the males might turn up. As luck would have it, there's been a 24-hour delay on their appearance. Maggie and the cubs are long gone. What will happen when the males finally meet the cubs? And will Lisa give in to Felix's advances? Coming up, the hyena pack splits up in search of food and nocturnal adventures. Last time in the Mandulia section, Lolly surprised an old resident of the area. Rulani was most put out at having to scuttle up a tree after successfully bringing down a young giraffe. Lolly's hunger didn't get the better of her common sense, though, and she resisted the urge to pirate the giraffe, lest Rulani pounce on her from above. Tia and the girls are still acclimatizing to life outside the boma. More usually, spotted hyenas tend to laze away the day while waiting for night to fall before setting off on their adventures. But daytime activity is also not uncommon. Tia enjoys Giggle's attention. As the dominant female, she must be sniffed and groomed by the others. Hyena packs are matriarchal. The women are in charge. If the group should ever grow to include males, Tia will still remain the top gun. Lolly, as a subordinate, must be content to groom herself. Likewise for Giggles. The hyena clan has been spending a lot of time in the Mandulia section for good reason. The Mandulia is where the wild dogs live. Which means plenty of leftover kills to scavenge. These old bones might be sniffed at by other animals, but even the toughest skeletons pose no challenge to the highly adapted and powerful jaws on the hyena. The girls while away the hours until nightfall, when they'll sharpen up into extremely effective hunter scavengers.
The sun goes down and the pack stirs, readying themselves for a fun night of feeding and harassing other predators. As often happens, the clan splits up into smaller units. Tia and Giggles head off on their own. Lully too has an important agenda for tonight, which need not involve the others. She sets out for the boma, which housed the girls before they were released. Just witnessed an amazing thing. Lolly regurgitating some of the objects that she was unable to digest. Lots of leather, rubber, teeth, bones, fur, and even an unidentified object something that she's picked up and that someone's going to miss. What is it about the boma that brings Lolly right up to the fence? A pair of gleaming eyes answers the question, a male hyena. Meanwhile, Tia and Giggles are hot on the trail of a fresh leopard kill. They're managing to follow the leopard, but no sign of the kill yet. Tashing appears through the gloom. With Tia's clan entering Rolani's territory, the leopard vacation has come to an end. Back at the boma, Lolly spots a second male behind the fence. In the interim, Toshinga gives Tia and Giggles the slip. She's also treed her kill, and in doing so, guaranteed herself a feed. Lolly is captivated by the males, leading researchers to speculate that she may be coming into estrus. A sound alerts her to the arrival of a most unwelcome presence. The scent of hyenas draws the curious Kurongwe pride to the fence. Just as the female hyena's captivity brought Felix and Zero to the boma some months ago. Lolly really doesn't need this in her life, and the flirting comes to an end. The pride shows great interest in Lolly's pile of regurgitated material. Toshinga, meanwhile, feasts at her leisure, having outwitted tear and giggles. The carcass hangs precariously by its horns, should it drop, the hyenas will hit the jackpot. The lions pack up. Lolly has slipped away and there'll be no action at the boma tonight. With the hyenas getting used to the big cats, a confrontation or fight between them is inevitable. It's not a question of if, but when. Next time on Wildlife Diary, Felix and Zero meet Maggie's cubs. Duchess allows her pups their first taste of fresh air. Cobra and Shungu manage to pull one out of the hat. As does the lovely Yanina on behalf of her cubs. Researchers report that Rolani may have other problems looming on the horizon. The leopard detects a strange foreign scent round and about his territory. 
At first, he appears unconcerned. But then, as night falls, the sounds of the bush confirm his suspicions. Rolani shrugs off the calls of the male intruder. He'll deal with this in his own time. But who is this interloper? Could he prove more powerful than Rolani? The rest of the Karongwe herd is tired of Flippy's antics. Feeling ignored, the young bull chooses to spend some time on his own. The Karongwe winter has not been kind to Cobra and Shungu. The brothers are failing to bring down any meat to make ends meet. This time, a tragic discovery. The wild dogs do what they do best. Lisa stands guard over Maggie's wildebeest kill. And the hyenas continue their nocturnal explorations. The Adini section in recent weeks has been the happy frolicking ground of Melissa's brood. The proud mother has done well to get the five youngsters this far, considering the high mortality rate of cheetah cubs. 24-hour cameras, wildlife sitcom and drama, emotional cliffhangers, reality TV at its best. The difference? The actors, African wildlife. The set, the African bush. The script writer and producer, Mother Nature. Last time on Wildlife Diary, Maggie introduced her cubs to the pride. Duchess organized a peace deal between Alf and Biggles. Melissa showed that she could be a mother along with the best of them. And Rolani struggled to eat his giraffe amidst a lot of interference. Her astute parenting skills have raised everyone's hopes. Perhaps these beautiful cubs may just survive to maturity. But it's only a matter of days, and Adini once more reveals the results of nature's harsh methods. Found it. Yeah, everything is exactly as we found it. Nothing's been moved. I have no doubt that you can see the lions. And the whole spine's broken. One bite to the to the back, and it looks like one bite to the head. And just left like this. Head researcher Kaylee Owen and Karongwe manager Philip Owen are devastated. But nothing in comparison to Melissa, who desperately calls for her cubs. The remaining cubs have trauma and shock written all over their little faces. With some relief, Melissa realizes that a few of her litter are still alive. 